everyone. Uh, I'm Chavi, and I welcome you all to the 15th talk in the Data Science Webinar Series organized by MANAV, the Human Access Initiative. Some housekeeping rules before we start. For all the participants, please post your questions, and uh, we want you to post a lot of questions, but please post them in the Q&A tab below. This is right next to your chat box. Do not use the chat box, but uh, use the Q&A tab. We will take the questions at the end of the talk. So today I would, I would take the liberty to start the session on a personal note. Uh, two members of my own family have suffered from breast cancer and they have recovered. The underlying molecular heterogeneity associated with breast cancer and cancer in general poses many therapeutic challenges. But thanks to all the research that is going on into studying this very complex disease that is making it possible for us to cure more and more women around the world who are reported with breast cancer. To discuss this and more in detail, we have today joining us Dr. Rachel Mitrajan. She heads the functional genomics team in the Breast Cancer Now Toby Robbins Research Center at the Institute of Cancer Research in London. In 2012, Dr. Natarajan was awarded a career development fellowship, after which she started her own lab within the Division of Breast Cancer at the ICR and has throughout had a very prolific career in cancer research. So welcome, Dr. Natarajan, and over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I'll just share my screen. So let me know if you can see things OK. Uh, can um, you see the presentation? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So it's full screen. Good. Yeah. Good. Okay. Um, so again, thank you for inviting me to speak with you today. It's a pleasure to be here. And I'm going to talk about some of the recent advances in breast cancer genomics and how the use of next generation sequencing in particular is revealing the molecular heterogeneity of breast cancer and how we can start to use this information to treat patients in the clinic and improve their their um, clinical outcome. So um, just a summary of my talk, I'm going to give a brief summary about the background of breast cancer and how we currently treat the disease, and um, talk a little bit about the advances of next generation sequencing. But most of my talk will be focused on how these technologies um, have increased our understanding of both the inter-tumor genetic heterogeneity, so between patients, and also intra-tumor genetic heterogeneity. So that's within an individual patient as well. And some of, the, some of the challenges we face and how we're starting to think about how to overcome these. So uh, breast cancer is not a single disease and the mainstay of breast cancer patient management involves when a patient come, is diagnosed with breast cancer, presents with a lump, um, you know, this is bi either biopsied or the patient undergoes surgery. And then this is sent off to the pathologist, which, which looks, who looks at a number of parameters. So the size of the tumour, um, the grade of the tumour, so the, the morphology in the nucleus of the, of the cancer, the histological subtype of the tumour, whether the patients have um, cancer involved in their lymph nodes, and also whether it's spread to distant organs, so has metastasized. And these give us an indication of how good or um, bad the patient will do under particular therapy. So when it goes to the pathologist, we also look at um, expression of particular markers within breast cancer, such as the estrogen receptor, progesterone receptor, and the human epidermal growth factor receptor, or HER2. And together with, with these clinical parameters, looking at ER, PR, and HER2 expression, this defines breast cancer patient therapy. So for example, um, the estrogen receptor um, High expression is present in around 70% of all breast cancers. And generally these patients you know, respond quite well to um, current standard of care. And this is because we now have anti-ER anti therapies such as tamoxifen or aromatase inhibitors. This, this is an example of what we call immune histochemistry. So this is routinely done um, in the lab on um, most breast cancer patients that come through and we stain for the presence of ER. So you can see the brown stain in the cancer cells indicates high expression of the estrogen receptor. And this works to signal through presence of estrogen and drive cell proliferation. 
And these cells that have high levels of estrogen receptor expression are addicted to the uh, signaling through, through estrogen for the cell survival. So if you inhibit it through anti-ER therapies, then the cells don't proliferate anymore and eventually die off. So this is a mainstay of treatment for ER positive disease in the clinic. And really this has transformed patient care and is extending the survival of patients, you know, up to 20, 30 years. And, and quite a few of these patients are now cured. So as well as ER expression, we also look at HER2 expression. And again, um, this, this is a, the HER2 receptor tyrosine kinase, which is a tyrosine kinase molecule. So again, it signals um, for the cells to grow. And in around 15% of breast cancer patients, they have extra copies of this gene leading to gene amplification. So you can see this here through the use of fluorescent in situ hybridization. So instead of two copies that a normal cell will have, it will have up to 100 extra copies. And this leads again to overexpression of the protein, which you can see here in the brown stain. And um, again, we can treat these patients with HER2 gene amplification with anti-HER2 therapies because the cells that have overexpression of the protein are addicted to the signaling to drive their cell growth. And um, common therapies are trastuzumab, um, which is a monoclonal antibody, and also small molecule inhibitors such as lapatinib. And so again, these, these and many others are now used clinically to treat breast cancer patients. Um, the remainder of breast cancer patients um, we call either triple negative or ER negative, HER2 negative and PR negative. And these account for 15% of breast cancer patients. And unfortunately, because they don't express ER or HER2, um, then we can't treat them with any of these anti-ER or anti-HER2 therapies. So these patients are generally treated with chemotherapy and as such tend to have a poorer prognosis. So this is the mainstay of breast cancer treatment at the moment. And back in 2000, um, seminal gene expression profiling studies were carried out by Chuck Peru and colleagues. And these were the first studies to really describe the molecular heterogeneity of breast cancer. So aside from ER and HER2, looking and they dubbed these the intrinsic molecular subtypes of breast cancer. And so here they took a set of 78 um, breast cancer samples. See, these are primary breast cancer samples before any treatment. And then uh, looked at the molecular makeup at the RNA level. And this is just what we call a heat map. So green is down regulation of genes and red is up regulation of genes. And they could, um, by unsupervised clustering, identify five different subgroups of breast cancer, breast cancers. So the luminal subgroup, um, they dub because they have gene expression patterns that are similar to the normal luminal cells within the breast. Um, and these are generally ER positive, where uh, they have a subgroup called luminal A breast cancers that have a better prognosis and luminal B, which are more proliferative and have a uh, poorer prognosis. And there's a subgroup called normal breast or normal like that have uh, gene expression features more similar to other normal cells within the breast. HER2 enriched, so have um, high expression of the gene HER2 um, and basal like breast cancers which overlap with the ER negative, HER2 negative subgroup, and again, have a poor prognosis. And the, this subgroup of breast cancers express high levels of um, keratins that are similar to the basal or myoepithelial cells within the normal breast. And the importance of this really is that it translates clinically. So this is what we call the Kaplan-Meier curve, and I'm gonna be showing a few of these through my talk. So you can see here, we plot the probability of a patient um, relapsing, or dying from their disease against the time. So you can see those patients with basal-like breast cancer, so mainly ER negative in red, have a much poorer prognosis. And similarly, on the opposite side, these patients that have luminal A breast cancer up here at the top have a good prognosis. So if we can start to subclassify these breast cancers, we can um, predict a patient's outcome. And I'm not going to talk about this today, but this is, um, what is now being done clinically with some of these gene expression tests that classify particularly ER positive breast cancer patients into luminal A and luminal B breast cancers. And then decisions are made whether to actually give them um, chemotherapy or not. Um, so that was back in 2000. And this, you know, this idea of the molecular heterogeneity was, uh, came about. But the advent of next generation sequencing has added a, added a 
different level of complexity and really increased our understanding of the molecular heterogeneity of the disease. So just briefly, next generation sequencing is an advance on what we call first generation sequencing or Sanger sequencing. And I'm sure you've all heard of Sanger sequencing because it was um, described by Fred Sanger probably almost like 40 or 45 years ago now. Um, and this is where we amplify specific regions of the genome, so DNA or RNA via PCR. And then these are run on a gel and you can distinguish the different bases to make up the base pair sequence of, of the particular gene you're looking at. So second generation or next generation sequencing builds on this, but it's large scale, high throughput sequencing at a fraction of the cost and time of Sanger sequencing. And to put it into context, um, what was done was we um, researchers sequenced the, the human genome, which was completed back in 2003. And that took you know, 10 to 15 years, but now we can do this within a matter of days within second generation or next generation sequencing. And so this is conceptual breakthrough. So there's no need for gel electrophoresis and it's based on the parallelization of sequencing reactions. So this is just exemplified here in this cartoon. So what we do is take our DNA or RNA, fragment it into short pieces, and then we adapt, um, we put adapters on the end, ligate adapters on the ends. These then stick to a, a glass slide called a, called a flow cell. And these individual molecules then are amplified um, clonally by bridge amplification. And then we put on a pool of labeled oligonucleotides so of each of the different bases. And then we, um, when these are incorporated into these individual clusters, we can read them out through imaging. So this gives us a real time readout of the base pair, individual base pair makeup of, of these different um, molecules. What then happens is that we align these short reads to the reference genome to identify the genetic changes. So here's just a summary of an example of that. So here's the reference sequence of the human genome. And you can see at this position, there's an A. And in the, our short reads that we've aligned to the genome, there's actually a C here. So this is a, a point mutation. And so this may change the, the, the amino acid within this protein, leading to a functional change. And so as well as mutations, we can also detect copy number alterations, such as deletions, so homozygous deletions where we have no copies of particular regions of chromosomes, hemizygous deletions, so um, partial deletions, um, gains of chromosomal material, so extra copies, such as I talked about with the HER2 amplification. And also these studies are quite useful for looking at now translocation. So um, where one chromosome has become juxtaposed to another chromosome. And so we can look at a whole plethora of different alterations within just one sequencing reaction. So what's already been done with next generation sequencing in cancer research? Well, um, a lot of things. I'm gonna to focus today really on the somatic genetics, but just to highlight that many people have looked at hereditary cancers and changes in germline as well using these types of approaches. But in the context of somatic genetics, so this means those changes that are specific to the cancer cell, um, this is really identified and revealed into tumor genetic heterogeneity and started to reveal additional disease classification. And I think more importantly, which I'll talk about a lot in my next slides, is therapeutic targeting identification. Um, we can also look at intratumor genetic heterogeneity which is becoming more apparent and how we can, I'm gonna talk about a bit later, how we can start to use this to, um, to monitor the disease as it progresses. So um, as I said, next generation sequencing um, has, has really revealed the inter-tumor genetic heterogeneity of the disease and reveal the differences between the different subgroups of breast cancer that have been identified from RNA profiling. So again, if you look at here, just to remind you that in the seminal studies back in 2000, they identified five different subgroups of breast cancer. So ER positive luminal tumors, which can be split into luminal A, good prognosis, luminal B, poor prognosis, normal breast, HER2 enriched, and the very poor prognosis phase like ER negative breast cancers. But ne what next generation sequencing has done is kind of subdivided these further. So you can see this in 
on this half of the slide here. So this is an example of what we call surcos plots. You don't have to understand these in much detail, but just appreciate that mutations are depicted on the outside of the circle. Uh, copy number alterations in the middle, and we can see, for example here, translocations um, across the center of the circle. And so even though these two breast cancer samples are both luminal A, you can see this one has, a, has much less going on in its genome than this breast cancer patient sample. And this is true between you know, luminal B breast cancer as well. Again, this one has what we call a quiet genome, whereas this patient's tumor has a lot more going on. So many more mutations, more copy number alterations, and more um, chromosomal translocations. And this is a trend as we go from luminal A to luminal B to basal-like breast cancer. We see an increasing complexity within the disease. And this is a, an extreme example um, in a study that we published a few years ago looking at the molecular makeup of basal-like breast cancers. And you can see that the, you know, there's many mutations and the genome is, is very altered. And you can just see just by the number of translocations that this, this patient's tumor has. So indicating that, which is a common theme that basal-like breast cancers really have underlying um, defects in how they repair their DNA as they, as they proliferate. And so um, many people have heard about these large sequencing efforts um, through large consortia such as the Cancer Genome Atlas. And these have really kind of revolutionized how we understand uh, the genomic makeup of different tumor types. And, um, and these consortia have sequenced many of the common tumor types to date in large numbers. And this can only really be done with the resources if you pull, to, pull together. Um, and so these consortia have really been revolutionary in identifying the genomic changes in different types of cancers. But back in 2012, um, there was a publication on breast cancer from the Cancer Genome Atlas. And here they did sequencing um, of the exome. So this is the coding region of the genome in over 500 primary breast cancers. And just to kind of highlight the scale of, of these experiments, this, this study revealed there was over 30,000 mutations in these 510 breast cancers. So at the time, this was quite revolutionary because it was many more than we anticipated. Um, and most of these were these point mutations, so single base pair changes. And this revealed um, 600, over 600 mutations in known cancer genes, so genes that we know have a role in driving cell growth and um, are associated with tumorigenesis. And these include PI3 kinase, P10, AKT1, uh, P53, and some others as well. But it also revealed a number of new breast cancer genes. And um, my lab and many others are trying to understand the, the function of these genes and try and work out if they drive breast cancer tumor genesis are associated with prognosis in different subgroups of breast cancer. And furthermore, um, how we can think about how to target these. And so this, um, the results from the Cancer Genome Atlas studies are depicted here as well. And so we can see, um, you know, the, these more common mutations that have been picked up uh, are more frequent in the ER positive subgroups of breast cancer. So, for instance, PI3 kinase mutations are more common in ER positive luminal A and luminal B breast cancers and not very common in basal light breast cancers. And so we can start to see differences in the mutational repertoire between mainly ER negative and ER positive disease. And as another example, um, next generation sequencing has identified these mutations in this gene GATA3, which is involved in estrogen signaling. And you can see here that they're more common in luminal A and luminal B breast cancers. So these are just uh, diagrammatic representations of the protein. And you can see the clustering of the mutations from each individual patient. So GATA3 is mutated in ER positive tumors, and it's a good prognostic biomarker. P53 is most commonly mutated in basal-like or ER-negative breast cancers, and P53 is, you know, or, there's a lot already known about this gene, and it drives an aggressive behaviour, and so it has the highest prevalence in the poorest prognosis group of breast cancers. But again, back to my point about, you know, there's um, the frequency of mutations in primary breast cancer. Actually, if you plot them out, and here's just a frequency plot of the, the most common mutations, we can see 
Mutations such as PI3 kinase are most common. This is across all subtypes of breast cancer, around 35%, and P53 around 30%. But then this drastically drops. So this was quite a novel finding at the time um, when these studies came up because you know there's there's many recurrently mutated genes, but they're at quite low frequency. You know, some of them down here, even though we know that they're they're involved in tumor cell growth such as RB1, they're present at a frequency in the breast cancer population of around you know two percent. So this this is something that we're looking at as well. You know, what is the role of some of these genes? You know, are they what we call driver alterations? So do they impart a tumorigenic phenotype on the on the cancer cells? Are they implicated in breast cancer progression and therapy resistance? And if they are, you know, how we can therapeutically target these. So the take-home messages from these studies really are that breast cancers display complex genomes and there's few very highly recurrently mutated genes but there's this large number of genes that are rarely mutated and it really is a challenge to kind of decipher uh, the, the role of these quite low frequency mutated genes. And so um, this is something that we've been working on and others so I'm just going to highlight some of the, the recent studies that have identified some of these alterations at low frequency and how we can translate these into the clinic. So one of the things that came out of the next generation sequencing studies, as I said, you know, we look at these low frequency uh, mutations, is that um, we can identify alterations that are, are new, but we all, that we know the function of the gene. So a nice example is that of HER2. So the TCJ studies identified that HER2 gene mutations were present at low frequency in breast cancers. So I talked about at the beginning how we can use anti-HER2 therapy for those patients with HER2 gene amplification, so extra copies of the gene. But it hadn't been appreciated before that there were also mutations in HER2. And, and these mutations generally cluster in the kinase domain of the protein. So this is the domain of the protein that, that signals to um, drive cell growth. These mutations are rare, so they belong in this long, that long tail of mutations and they're actually seen mainly in non-HER2 amplified breast cancers. So this, so it seems like it might be another way of activating HER2 um, in non-HER2 amplified breast cancers. So a, a different mechanism to extra copies of the gene. And interesting, these mutations were found to be more frequent in those patients with um, aggressive sort of relapsed lobular breast cancer, which is um, a, a rarer histological subtype of breast cancer. So this study back in 2013 actually went a bit further to, to try and dissect the function of these individual mutations um, in, in HER2. And in particular, you can see that these mutations cluster, as I said, around the kinase domain and also the extracellular domain of the protein. And what they did was clone each of these mutations and put them in some normal breast epithelial cells and to see if they transformed them. And what they found was that they, and many of these mutations activate the known downstream pathways involved in HER2 signaling. If you put them in, in vivo in mice, they actually grow very well, whereas the epithelial cells on their own don't grow at all. So they induce tumorigenicity in vivo. So they, they cause cancer cell growth. But interestingly, they cause sensitivity to some of these tyrosine kinase inhibitors against HER2. And this is a particular one called neratinib, that's a, what we call an irreversible tyrosine kinase inhibitor. So it binds to the kinase domain, but it can't be competed out, whereas some, of, some others that are used in the clinic can be. So if you look at these red bars here, you can see that compared to the control, they suppress the, the growth of the cells with these mutations if you treat them with these tyrosine kinase inhibitors. So um, on the back of this data, there's a, a number of clinical trials that have been set up to assess this in patients. So treating patients with particular with HER2 mutant metastatic breast cancer with these drugs. And this is one that was published last year looking at um, neratinib. So again, this is the structure of the HER2 gene. And you can see the mutations mainly clustering in the uh, kinase domain. And if you just focus on this bottom half here, you can see that when the investigators gave patients neratinib in combination with, in this case, it was endocrine therapy, 
you can see that there's a number of patients that have a complete response. So these, these red spots here, indicating that you know, we can quite quickly translate the findings from next generation sequencing into clinical benefit for particular patients. And actually you can see that there's a number of particular mutations that respond better to these drugs than others, indicating we can start to you know, think about how we can use next generation sequencing to identify these patients with HER2 gene mutations and then give them um, inhibitors such as neratinib to improve their uh, outcome. So that's, that's a nice example how we can quite quickly, you know, take the findings from next generation sequencing and translate them into the clinic. One of the other findings that's um, been quite prominent, particularly in the context of ER positive breast cancer, is that um, next generation sequencing has identified the presence of ESR1 mutations in hormone resistant ER positive breast cancers. So ESR1 is the gene that encodes the estrogen receptor. And these mutations are found um, at a very low frequency in primary ER positive breast cancers. So again, they're in this long tail of mutations um, at a frequency of around 1%. And um, when, when researchers have started looking at profiling metastatic disease, they found that there was an increased frequency of these mutations. And in particular, those patients that's been treat treated with aromatase inhibitors, and these inhibitors cause estrogen deprivation. And then the, and, um, patients develop resistance to these drugs. And so these ESR1 mutations um, seem to affect the ligand binding domain of ER. So this is the signaling part of the protein. So signals, so estrogen binds and signals through this ligand binding domain uh, to drive cell proliferation. And so we can see in this plot here that um, many of the mutations identified in ESR1 are in this ligand binding domain. And what researchers have done is um, again looked at this um, in the lab. And in particular, this most common mutation, this tyrosine 537 to serine, um, if you again express it in cells in in the lab um, and treat them with some of these endocrine you know, estrogen deprivation agents, such as fulvestrans, you can see that compared to um, the, the control here, that these cells don't respond as well to um, so, some of these agents, indicating that they cause resistance. And th you know this is what we start to see as a major clinical problem to some of these drugs. And so we can now think about how um, to treat these patients that have these ESL1 mutations and which type of um, therapy to, to give them next. So um, as I said, you know, mutations are starting to emerge that occur on ther therapy selection. And there was a study two years ago from Memorial Sloan Kettering that looked at this in a bit more detail, particularly in the context of ER positive breast cancer and resistance to these ER targeting agents or endocrine therapies. And this is just a summary of the data here. So what they did was take patient biopsies that were untreated and then the corresponding metastatic biopsy from the same patient and looked at the frequency of alterations. So mutations that were present in the primary disease versus the metastatic disease. And what they found was that um, basically upon, upon therapy, um, certain mutations start to emerge so I've just talked about the emergence of ESL1 mutations. And, you know, these go from kind of frequency of less than 1% in primary disease to 18% in resistant disease. But there's also, they identified other mechanisms of resistance to endocrine therapy, such as um, amplifications of the transcription factor to MYC, increased expression of uh, signaling pathways through MAP kinase. But the vast majority of patients, they couldn't identify the mechanism of resistance to some of these endocrine agents. And so, um, so there may be other mutations that are within this, the cells in the primary disease that, that drive resistance as well. And so this is something, uh, again, that we're looking at in the lab. But um, more recently, we found that, or well, researchers have found that within the context of ER positive breast cancer, when they become resistant to endocrine therapy, they increasingly rely on the G1S checkpoint um, to drive the, the cell cycle. And this, this can be inhibited through the use of CDK4-6 inhibitors because CDK4 and CDK6 in particular, these 
SACL independent kinases are involved in the transition from G1 to S phase in driving cell proliferation. And this is just depicted here. So this is a study from quite a while ago, but it looked at the role of CDK4-6 inhibitors in ER positive um, breast cancer. So here they took a, a panel of all sorts of different cell, breast cancer cell lines and then treated them with a CDK4-6 inhibitor. And they found that those cell lines that responded very well to these short bars here are mainly ER positive. So cell lines expressing ER together with increased levels of uh, the retinoblastoma protein and cycling D1 um, are most sensitive to the inhibitory effects of these CDK4-6 inhibitors. And here they use a drug called palpocyclib. And so this is translated quite quickly into the clinic. Um, and this is a study from one of my, my colleagues at the Institute of Cancer Research who led the Paloma 3 uh, phase 3 trial looking at this. So this was um, stratifying patients with metastatic ER positive breast cancer um, with a placebo and endocrine agent versus halbocyclib, so the CDK4-6 inhibitor and an endocrine agent. And you can see that those patients with given palbocyclib plus fulvestrans have an increased survival compared to those that just had the fulvestrans on their own. And the results of this um, phase three trial um, has led to the, the approval of palbocyclib for metastatic ER positive breast cancer patients. Um, so this has been quite revolutionary in the past few years. But as with endocrine therapy, resistance emerges to CDK4-6 inhibitor therapy as well. So this is where we can start to think about using next generation sequencing um, to identify those patients that uh, are more likely to become resistant and also identify the mechanisms of resistance to some of these agents and think about how we can start to treat those patients or the next therapy to give them. And this is an example of a study that came out a couple of years ago. So they were looking again in the context of a clinical trial where they were treating patients with CDK4-6 inhibitor therapy. And here they sequenced the biopsies of uh, the patients undergoing therapy and they looked for the frequency of mutations. And so you can see in this plot here that those patients that have a worse outcome have mutations in the retinoblastoma protein RB1, which is involved in this G1S checkpoint, and also this, this novel gene FAT1. And they looked at FAT1 in a bit more detail and they found that if um, the patients have mutations that cause truncation of the protein, um, so it allows it not to be expressed at all, so deletions and truncating mutations, have a much poorer outcome. And in fact, they don't respond at all to CDK4-6 inhibitor therapy. So if you can identify these patients up front, you probably wouldn't give them a CDK4-6 inhibitor. You want to give them something else. And so work is ongoing now in this, this lab in particular to look for you know, new ways of treating patients that have these FAT1 mutations. So again, this is just an example of how we can use next generation sequencing you know, to identify patients that may or may not respond to particular therapies and how we can think about using this information to direct treatment going forwards. And so, um, as I hope I've shown you in this bit of the talk, these new alterations can be detected in breast cancer through next generation sequencing approaches. And many have clinical relevance such as ESR1 mutations. And these require distinct approaches for individual patients. So in the context of ESR1 mutations, um, we now have to think carefully about which type of endocrine therapy to give these patients based on these mutations. And again, in the context of CDK4-6 inhibitor therapy, we have to think about the genetic mechanisms of resistance to new therapies, such as mutations in RB1 and FAT1. And if, these, if patients have mutations in these genes, there's no, no real point of putting them on a CDK4-6 inhibitor because they're not likely to respond. So we can start to stratify patients and put them into different subgroups and different therapeutic regimes based on the molecular makeup of their tumour. And so in the last part of the talk, I'm going to uh, discuss how next generation sequencing has really revealed the intratumor genetic heterogeneity within uh, an individual breast cancer patient and how we can detect it and the clinical consequences. So as I've talked about, um, treatment resistance is a clinical problem um, in the patient management of breast cancer. And next generation sequencing has provided a critical tool to address some of these mechanisms.
but it often doesn't account for multiple mechanisms of resistance in the same patient. And this then becomes a problem when designing the next drug to give patients. Um, and this is what we call intra-tumor heterogeneity. So the difference in the molecular makeup um, and the evolution when we put um, the therapeutic pressure on these cancer cells and the clones that emerge. So this is depicted here, and we can think about this in the context of Darwinian evolution. So tumors consist of multiple genetically distinct subclones even before they have seen any therapy. And then um, in this cartoon here, you can see that the dominant clone here um, in yellow, these cells in yellow have a particular mutation in gene one. Um, these tumor cells here have mutations in gene one and gene two. And then these green cells here have a mutation in gene one and gene three. And so if you put a selective pressure on these cells such as therapy, um, some of these clones have a selective advantage because they have mutations in particular genes and then they can dominate the population and outgrow. And it's really, I mean, this becomes more complicated than this because you get multiple of these subclones uh, growing out with different genetic alterations. And it's how to detect this and how we can think about um, circumventing the emergence of some of these resistance mechanisms going forward. And one way people have begun to do this is through the use of liquid biopsies. And so we can track patient response in the clinic using liquid biopsies. So um, this is a review that was published from a colleague of mine at the ICR. Um, and here, this is based on the premise you can take um, a liquid biopsy, so the blood sample from a patient, so it's non-invasive. And then because the cancer cells that are starting to metastasize float around the bloodstream, you can collect these in the blood. And in particularly the patients with metastatic disease have a higher proportion of these circulating tumor cells. And when these cells die, they release their DNA. And you can collect this um, if you spin it off the plasma of the blood. And then because the, the tumor DNA specifically has mutations because it's somatic, you can look at the, um, the alterations in this DNA. And then you can use either targeted approaches such as digital PCR or more holistic approaches such as exome sequencing to look at specific mutations within the circulating free DNA. So this is nice because you can take serial biopsies over the course of patient treatment without having to stick needles in patients, particularly you know, when you think about having to biopsy metastatic sites in the liver and lungs and things, which is nasty and hor horrible and invasive and distressing for the patient. So these technologies have started to become quite revolutionary in monitoring patient treatment to certain therapies. And at the gross level, um, we can look at the mutations in or the presence of circulating free DNA as a measurement of their tumor burden. And so this is an, as an example of one of the first studies that looked at this back in 2013. But you can see that in those patients that have, have a high amount of circulating free DNA in their blood, have a much poorer prognosis. So it really is a good indication of the amount of tumor burden. And this you know, circumvents quite a lot of scans and things, and you can often pick up um, circulating tumor cells or circulating free DNA within patients, even before you can see metastatic disease on a CT or PET scan. And so it's, this, this technology has really um, increased our understanding and uh, the utility of this idea of molecular residual disease monitoring. So, as I said, even in the absence of um, occult disease at metastatic sites, we can start to see if a patient is beginning to get um, resistance to particular therapy and their tumor, tumor cells are starting to grow more and metastasize into different organs. And as an example here, um, in this study, they looked at the presence of a p53 mutation and a pi3 kinase mutation in the blood of one particular patient over the course of their therapy. So this is a patient who um, developed breast cancer and then had various rounds of chemotherapy and didn't respond very well. Um, but it, but you can, so you can see this here in the frequency of the mutations. But when the patient was giving, given paclitaxel as a chemotherapy. Um, their PI3 kinase mutation almost disappeared. So it was non-detectable down here, whereas their P53 mutation remained stable. And then you can see you start to 
see emergence of resistance. So the frequency of the PR3 kinase mutation starts to increase. And again, the frequency of the P53 mutation also increases. So this is a nice example because you see molecular heterogeneity within one patient. So with the addition of paclitaxel, you're seeing that this patient is responding to some degree, but it's only killing off a certain proportion of tumor cells. So the ones with the P53 mutation don't respond at all. Um, so this is quite nice, you know, and you can, you can maybe work out what other alterations are in these, these cells here if you do more holistic profiling and then begin to target them. Um, this is an example, again, from a colleague of mine at the ICR who looked at this in the context of CDK4-6 inhibitor resistance using circulating free DNA. Um, so the, the same exa example, so taking blood draws um, serially over time of treatment. And here he did exome profiling to look at the repertoire of mutations um, on day one and at the end of treatment. So you can see, again, an increased frequency of ESR1 mutations um, uh, starting to occur because these patients are becoming resistant to, to full vestrans, and also increased frequency of PI3 kinase mutations and RB1 mutations. So you can start to see the emergence of resistance um, and the mechanisms of resistance just by looking at the circulating free DNA within a patient. So no biopsies at all. And this has been taken one step further in a clinical trial, again, from a colleague of mine at the ICR that was published very recently, um, where he set up a trial using circulating free DNA analysis across the patient's course of treatment to actually direct therapy. And so this was a trial in the advanced breast cancer setting, um, again, using circulating free DNA, using targeted sequencing. And then based on the alterations detected, these were allocated to treatment arms based on their mutation status. And this is an example of uh, one of the arms of the study where they gave AKT1 inhibitors to those patients that had a mutation in AKT1. So the box is in, in purple and blue. And you can see, um, this is what we call a waterfall plot, but um, those patients that have AKT1 mutations in blue and purple have a reduction in their tumor volume um, as assessed by CT scan um, compared to those patients that have other mutations. So you can really start to see that, that by putting these specific therapies into patients with particular mutations um, over the course of their treatment, they can, you can start to see a clinical response. And it's a nice, easy way of directing therapy um, in, in this manner. Um, but as we know, there are, as I showed you in this slide before, there are distinct mechanisms of resistance to different drugs. And again, going back to the example of endocrine resistance. And um, so far through exome and next generation sequencing, we've only been able to identify maybe 40% of the mechanisms of resistance. And even so, even in uh, these patients that have you know, alterations in MYC and MAP kinase, we still don't know really how to treat these cells that have alterations in in these genes. But more importantly, you know, the vast majority of patients, we don't know mechanisms of resistance. And also, if you start to think about intratumor genetic heterogeneity, um, you know, there are cells in the primary tumor. Some of these may pick up, for instance, an ESR1 mutation, and some of these will have these other mechanisms. So it's really that we want to try and target all these different mechanisms of resistance to really improve the patient outcome. And um, so it's all, not all genetic. There, there is emerging evidence that some of the mechanisms of resistance to treatment um, are epigenetic or present at the RNA level. And this is a nice study that kind of highlighted this. And they found in eopositive breast cancer patients that had high expression of this histone modification gene, KDM5B, um, drove high levels of differences at the RNA level, which they dubbed transcriptomic heterogeneity. So instead of being having different mutations, they had different RNA make makeups in these different cells. And this led to a high risk of therapeutic resistance. But they could reverse this effect by inhibiting this, this enzyme here through some small molecule inhibitors. And when they did this, they reversed this heterogeneity. And then the patients had um, a lower risk of therapeutic resistance and responded better to their endocrine therapy. And again, you can just see this in this Kaplan-Meier plot here. So patients with the high levels of KDM5B have high heterogeneity and a poorer prognosis. And so we can start to think about how to target some of these enzymes that cause 
um, you know, this high transcriptomic heterogeneity or differences in these different cells. And then um, just lastly to point out, new, there's new newer technologies coming available so we can start to look at this in more detail. And one of these that we're starting to use in the lab is single cell sequencing. Um, and so this, you know, instead of looking at the bulk population, we look at each individual single cell and work out the molecular alterations in these, in these cells. And this is a nice study in, um, in ER negative or triple negative breast cancer patients, where they took patient biopsies through um, chemotherapy treatment, so pre and post treatment, and looked at the single cell level, and in particular the RNA level of um, the molecular makeup of these cells. And you'd have to understand this in much detail, but just to point out that uh, this is a plot from just one patient where each of these um, circles is an individual cell. You can see that there are cells in the pretreatment sample, so on this side of the plot, that have a very similar molecular profile to those uh, of the post-treatment sample. So this suggests that there is a minority of cells within the pretreatment sample that are already primed to be resistant to chemotherapy in this context. So if we can identify these cells up front and what is the molecular makeup of these cells, we perhaps can then identify new treatment options to combine with chemotherapy to kill off these cells before they become resistant. And so with that, I'll conclude. And I hope I've shown you that tumors are composed of multiple genetically diverse clones and additional mutations are accumulated over time. And at diagnosis, tumors are already what we call mosaics, so multiple subclones. And we can use new technologies such as single cell sequencing to try and um, look at this a bit further. And I've also talked about how, um, you know, there's quite a lot of intra-tumor genetic heterogeneity within breast cancer, and the use of circulating free DNA may, over may help overcome some of these challenges. But some of the challenges that we also face is that many of the mutated genes or altered genes within breast cancers are not currently druggable. Um, and so there's many efforts ongoing to try and identify ways of targeting these. And lastly, you know, as I've shown in the last couple of slides, not all alterations are genetic. So we just can start to look at the transcriptomic or epigenetic makeup of, of cancer cells and work out what alterations are going on and how we can target those. So I'll stop there and take any questions. And thank you for listening. Thank you, Dr. Nutrajan. That was actually a very interesting talk. I found myself taking notes and uh, <laughs> uh, it was beautiful how, um, so as you know that a lot of our listeners uh, are undergraduates and master's students and um, it's such a complex topic, not just that the disease is complex, but the fact that it is a complex topic. and. Um, I feel here yeah, that you 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 put it in in a way that even I think the undergrads uh, you know could understand and it was engaging from you know from the beginning and uh, I didn't even realize that <laughs> okay now I have okay. Yes. Such, <laughs> such, little, such little time left so this is great there are uh, a few questions that we have from the listeners and uh, since you ended a note on a epigenetic. Uh, uh, note right your your talk on an epigenetic note there's a not a related, but a, a, a kind of a similar question where a student wants to know that, uh, that uh, so the, I'll read out the question that uh, uh, whether, uh, whether there is, uh, whether there is, uh, uh, I'm trying, okay. Okay, so they want to know whether long non-coding RNAs also are looked at in breast uh, in breast cancers, and uh, whether the uh, techniques used for uh, working with these long coding RNAs are different from a regular NGS that is used. Yeah, so people are starting to look at long non-coding RNAs. There, it's an emerging field. Um, and the, the techniques, well, you can use RNA sequencing. So it's similar to exome sequencing, but you look at the RNA level. Um, so people are starting to look at that. You can't at the moment look at that in the context of circulating free or in liquid biopsies. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is that the RNA isn't stable. Um, it gets degraded when the cells sh you know, shed 
um, or, or die off in the circulation. So most of the work at the moment in the context of circulating free DNA and liquid biopsies is at the DNA level. People are starting to look at epigenetic alterations in the context of liquid biopsies, so methylation changes, which may be, there's some evidence that it's going to be a bit more sensitive than looking at mutations. Um, okay. Yeah, but long non-coding RNAs at the moment in liquid biopsies aren't really feasible, but you can do them from tissue, um, you know. But, to, but I think because the, the field is quite young and people don't really know the functional, so much the functional consequences of the long non-coding RNA because they don't, they don't code proteins, um, yeah. it's, it's more difficult to dissect, yeah. Okay, yeah. So uh, you would not use them as much for uh, studying the metastatic aspects? No. Uh, compared to, yeah. But what, it, what is quite nice with the consortia such as the Cancer Genome Atlas, because they've also, you know, done RNA sequencing of all these breast cancers. Um, you can have a look, you can go and data mine. And we spend a lot of our time data mining, you know, and looking for new things that people have missed from these previous publications. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so, uh, that uh, brings me to something that I have been, I was wondering, and I think some of the students might be interested, is that, uh, as compared to ten years ago, how has the role of a scientist changed with the, you know with the on, with the upcoming of NGS and the research becoming more data intensive? Uh, how, how does the role of a of a scientist change as compared to you know me doing microarrays and uh, gels? And, you know, so. Yeah, I mean the volume of data you have to deal with is is a lot more. So I think having you know some understanding of bioinformatics and how to interpret the data is, is a must. Is it? Um, yeah. And I think, you know, we have to start, we have to converse with bioinformaticians more, more and more so. So having a common language uh, be between, you know, bioinformaticians, statisticians, uh, lab bench scientists is, is the key to driving this, this forward. And also, you know, working with clinicians to move things into clinical trials particularly in the context of what we do is, is a must as well. And, you know, you have to explain things to clinicians and they, you know, you also have to understand what they, they're talking about as well. So it's, yeah. So it's, it's becoming more multidisciplinary, I guess, is the answer. I think you hit the nail in the head that the, the, the ability to communicate and to have an understanding of yeah. different disciplines is important uh, going forward, yeah. I'll go to the next question, which is how difficult is it to track driver mutations in mature breast cancer as compared to early breast cancers due to clonal diversity? And how should it be dealt with when we have so many background mutations in a late stage tumor? Yeah, so that's a very good question. So it's, it's easier to detect circulating free DNA um, in metastatic breast cancers, so late breast cancers, because of the volume of the um, tumour cells that are being shed in the blood. Um, so most of the studies using circulating free DNA have really been done in kind of later stage breast cancers because of that, that re reason. Um, so there's this notion of maybe trying to detect circulating free DNA for early detection which is quite difficult at the moment with the limitations in sensitivity of the technologies, but it's something that a number of people are working on. Um, but in the context of how to track driver mutations, so that depends on what, how you define a driver mutation. Um, you know, and as I showed in my talk, there's a lot of mutations that are recurrently mutated that we don't know the function of, but are actually driving the tumour. And this is something that we're actively working on in the lab but you have to do all the lab experiments to prove that they're driving tumor genesis to call them a driver. Um, so I think in the best setting, you would try and do a more holistic approach using exome sequencing or, or as much as you can to track these clones over time. And I think the, you know, the example of the clinical trial I showed, the plasma match trial, which is really quite revolutionary. So if you can work out how to treat patients with particular mutations or particular genomic alterations, then, then they're the ones that you're wanting to be tra tracking. 
regardless, you know, even if there are other driving mutations in the tumour. Because if you can't target those driving mutations in particular, then, you know, it's, there's a question of how, you, how then you treat them. Then, then you're just monitoring disease. So there's two ways of looking at the circulating free DNA, one for monitoring tumour disease burden and one for therapeutic targeting. Right. Um, the next question is that, uh, do you use or do people use uh, artificial intelligence or machine learning in uh, interpreting data that comes, that comes to you from NGS? Yeah, so people are starting to do that a bit more. Um, um, we haven't looked at it so far, but I know in particular in pathology, there's a lot of image analysis and artificial intelligence going on with pathology. So working out um, if you have a hematoxin and stain section, you know, mm -hmm. what are the predictive or prognostic features within those that may you know, predict whether a patient may or may not respond to therapy and those types of things at the moment. Um, and then people are then kind of integrating that with next generation sequencing on top um, and using multi-layer modalities, I guess, to predict patient response, yeah. But it's, it's early stages at the moment. Um, I, um, yeah. So I, this is a, um, this is a question that I, uh, I want to ask you, you've probably answered this uh, to some to some extent in your talk and in the questions that we've had so far. Uh, so what is the extent of uh, industry partnerships that you do in your uh, in your work or in your lab on a regular basis and what kind of industry partnerships are required to take your, take the work uh, from patients to lab and in uh, to, um, before before they reach the clinical stage or after they reach the clinical stage? Yeah, that's, that's a very good question. Um, it varies. Um, I'd say it depends. We mostly work with pharmaceutical companies who have the drug that we're interested in looking at in a certain population of breast cancer patients. So um, a lot of the pharmaceutical companies have access programs on a collaborative basis where they can give you some of their drug and you can test it um, in the lab. And then if you know you can show that it's having a good effect in your models in the lab, then they may be interested to help you set up a clinical trial and you can apply with them for funding to set up the clinical trials, which are expensive. Um, so yeah, so that's most of the industry kind of partnerships we have at the moment. Okay, um, and I'm also interested in understanding that how does the study of um, uh, of the intertumor heterogeneity, when you talk about the intertumor heterogeneity, how does the tumor uh, microenvironment uh, plays a role in that? It's a very it's a very vague question, but um. yeah, so it plays a big role. So that's something that I didn't touch on today because it's a it's another topic for another day. Um, yeah, I mean, particularly in, in ER negative breast cancers, so triple negative breast cancers, the role of the immune cells plays a huge role. Um, so if it, so it's actually prognostic. So in triple negative breast cancer, if there's a high level of immune cells within the tumor, so infiltrating lymphocytes, then that patient tends to have a better prognosis because their immune system is more primed for attacking the tumor. Um, and those are the patients that respond quite well to immunotherapies that are becoming, you know, more widely available. Um, it's a, you know, there's lots of clinical trials. So there's, there's some nice data emerging, particularly in triple negative breast cancers, that those patients with high immune infiltrate respond quite well to immunotherapy. So the, the downside of this is that as the patient gets more aggressive disease, you know, the cancers learn how to avoid the immune system. Um, and then, you know, these agents stop working. Um, so that, that's a problem and how this evolves over time. And there's obviously interactions between the immune cells and the cancer cells and also other cells within the tumor microenvironment, such as the, the fibroblast 
cancer-associated fibroblast cells as well. And they're, um, I mean, it's not a focus of what we're looking at because we can't look at everything. It's a, yeah, but it, it does play an important role, yeah. Uh, thanks, Dr. Nitrajan. That was, uh, like I said, it was a very inspiring talk, and I, I couldn't put my pen down or take my eyes away from, <laughs> uh, from this talk. And it was absolutely beautiful. Um, and also, what I did talk about, and I think which, uh, which is which was really interesting to our speakers, is that it talked about um, what is what is like what is what is currently happening, and uh, you know. Uh, thinking of breast cancer as a single disease and all the way to uh, finding out that there are, there are so many, so many mutations which define the interplay of uh, treatment that can be there. And, uh, and like you said, 60% of those uh, small portion, which is endocrine response, that's not even known. And that is just mm -hmm. one section. And then there's so many other genes that we don't know about just uh, shows how much opportunity for research and requirement for research exists. And I hope that is inspiring to all the young, uh, you know, the young uh, audience that we have. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, totally. So, so thanks a lot for your talk. Yeah. And I, I'm sorry, I could not hear that. Um, so, I, yeah. So, I, I think I would like to really thank you on behalf of the entire team. Uh, so, thank you, Dr. Trajan. Thank you very much for having me. Thanks. Um, and all, as always, we had uh, great participation from the audience. Uh, we're not able to take all the questions because uh, in the interest of time, but thanks everyone for attending this talk. Uh, and thanks to the outreach team at Manav who organized these uh, data science series and bring all these interesting people uh, to, for the students to, you know, uh, to, that they can talk to. Um, and the, the outreach team will reach out to all the attendees regarding the feedback form and the participation so it gets over email. And joining us uh, next will be Dr. Anu Ranganathan. That will be on November 19th. For more details, uh, keep a watch on the social media handles of Manav. And that's all from us here. Thanks everybody for joining. Thank you. Thank you.